nor cool waves, nor sand there were. Earth had not been, nor heaven above, but a yawning gap and grass nowhere. Then Boer's son lifted the level land, Mythgard the mighty they made, the sun from the south warmed the stones of the earth, and green was the ground with the growing leeks. In my book, Life and the Love of Life, I explored a concept put together by a physicist at MIT, and it's based on the second law of thermodynamics. It has to do with the formation of life and the creation of life. He proposed a theory that, that matter will most effectively develop to disperse the energy to which it is, it is exposed. And I go into great depth talking about the cool from the north and the warmth from the south and what comes, what, what is developed in the middle to help disperse that energy. When the ground, when the sun from the south warmed the stones of the earth, it begins to create a process where life grows. Growing leeks is a very fertile field. Leeks leaked out poison, they, they sucked up poison, they were a food staple, you could make soup. There's a lot of life in that. And there's a hint of that, pro of an understanding of what happens there in that paragraph. The sun, the sister of the moon from the south, her right hand cast over heaven's rim. No knowledge she had where her home should be. The moon knew not what might was his. The stars knew not where their stations were. And that's all very romantic, but there's also a reason for some of that. When, if you go up north to Alaska, you will find that in the summertime, the sun never really, it just dips below the horizon. And they're kind of talking about the sun, which he, in the far north where the sun goes down, her hand is just kind of over the horizon because it, it might go below the horizon about 1130, then come back up about one in the morning, but it stays daylight the entire time. She's just got her right hand cast over heaven's rim. It's a real romantic idea involved in that. No knowledge she had of where her home should be. She Maybe she's lost. The moon knew not what might was his, the controlling of the oceans, of men's emotions, of go to any emergency room on a night of a full moon and you will find people go crazy. Uh, there's, it's no accident that the legends of the werewolf happen during the full moon when men are feeling most primal when there's a lot of energy the tides are higher during a full moon and the stars knew not where their stations were if you don't know where the north star is Tiwaz, that guiding light it's going to be very difficult for you to navigate so here we have this paragraph where these gods are laying out all of these orderly things these ideas and concepts and symbols in the heavens that guide men through life and to distant locations. These are the things that help us a lot time. These are the things that allow us to schedule our day, when to plant, when to harvest, when to how to go from this land to the next land and never become lost. There's a real interesting thing there that demonstrates a benevolence towards these men and these gods and men. So there's a little bit more depth here than I think people want to give credit for it. Then sought the gods of their assembly seats, the holy ones in council held. Names they gave to noon and twilight, morning they named and the waning moon, night and evening the years to number. That's a continuation of that process whereby signs and symbols are given to men to navigate the course of their lives. And if of all met the mighty gods, shrines and temples they timbered high, forges they set, they smithied ore, tongs they wrought and tools they fashioned. These are the tools that build civilizations. These are the, this is the precursor of how life is supposed to be developed. You can come in, sweetie. And there's an important concept that goes with what they're developing here because they pass that knowledge on to us. And it's not only us, but it shows up in every other ancient civilization and ancient mythology around the world. And it shows up as a handbag but we get in, we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> in their dwellings at peace, they played at tables of gold, no lack did the gods then know, till thither came up, giants made three, huge of might, out of Jotunheim. Hey, don't use that rule. That is, um, now this is a reference to the three all-powerful female Jotuns that enter Asgard during its golden age, and it's mentioned again in the Gilfanganing. When he says uh, they, they made also a second hall that was a shrine which the goddesses had, and it was a very fair house. Men called it Vingol. Next, they fashioned a house wherein they placed a forge and made besides a hammer, tongs, and anvil, 
and by means of these all other tools, the foundational tools of civilizations. After this, they smithied metal and stone and wood and wrought so abundantly that metal which is called gold, that thing that we treasure, that they had all their household wear and all dishes of gold. So this is an abundant time. This is a time of no lack whatsoever. And that time is called the age of gold before it was spoiled by the coming of women, even those who came out of Jotunheim. That is not a denigration of women. That is a pointing out of the of three females that enter Asgard and bring with them certain concepts. And we'll get to them as we get down here when we talk about Golveg and Hyth. And there's a third one. The name of the third one comes up as well. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones in council held to find who should raise the race of dwarves out of Grimer's blood and the legs of Blaine. There was Montsignir, the mightiest maid of all the dwarves, and Durin next, many a likeness of men they made, the dwarves in the earth, as Durin said. So they were made like men, but they weren't men. And there's an interesting dynamic that occurs in Alva Small. Not everything that looks like a man may necessarily be a man. In the Alva Small, Alvis approaches Thor for the hand of his daughter in marriage. And Thor, instead of flying into a rage, demonstrates that wisdom of a king of his own home and he questions and answer, begins the question and answer cycle when everyone can question and answer well. It's something that's repeated throughout the lore. So this being who is may know everything, but when the sunlight strikes him, he turns to stone. He is not qualified. He is woefully inadequate to be married to a goddess who is Thor's daughter. So there's an interesting dynamic there when they're trying to talk about and figure out and name. And when you look at all their names in stanzas 11, and uh, 12 and 13, 14, 15, 16. This is where, this is where J.R.R. Tolkien got many of the names for the Lord of the Rings. But after they do this, after they create the dwarves, a second ensemble comes forth and begins a whole nother journey. Then from the throne did three come forth from the home of the gods, the mighty and gracious, two without fate on the land they found, Ask and Embla, the ash and the elm, empty of might. So here's, some people say it was driftwood. Some people say it was a living tree. Whatever the case may be, it was a shaping of life. It was, when you look at any tree, when you look at a redwood or an oak or any of the great forests, or a great grove of aspen trees, the largest living organisms on the planet are the groves of aspen in Colorado and the eastern front of the Rockies. And the only thing that tree knows to do is to grow. That's it. It doesn't know anything. Everything we've always been taught is that the only thing a tree knows how to do is to grow. It's going to become taller. It's going to become stronger. What that tree doesn't understand is that if we cut it down, we might shape a home with it. If we burn it, the energy contained in that tree will change into something so dynamic it can't even begin to imagine. And I think we're in the same boat. When you cut a tree down and burn it, all of the energy in that tree becomes fire and heat, and you can shape metal and smithy ore and all kinds of, you can cook with it. You can warm a home with it. Same thing happens with us. We have no idea what it looks like after we pass through that final door, that all roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to the sun-facing goddess. We will all have to contend with her as we pass into the halls of our ancestors. We have no idea what that might look like. When Odin, Vili, and Ve venture forth and they find two without fate on the land, they're empty of might. They can't shape their destiny. They only know to grow. Soul they had not, since they had not, heat nor motion nor goodly hue. Soul gave Odin, since gave Honir, heat gave Lothar a goodly hue. Three gifts. Three powerful gifts that when used properly, when we understand the language of the birds, when we understand the runes, when we understand the flows of energy across the surface of this planet, soul, sense, heat, a goodly hue, we find ourselves in possession of those tools that allow us to travel to every single continent, to outer space, to take a grand ideas and make them grander, to build on a scale that today our ancestors might look at it and consider it magic, and yet we look at what they've built and we can't begin to compare to that. 
So it shapes, it changes, it flows, it's a flow of energy. Soul, sense, heat, and goodly hue. There's a real powerful there that a real powerful set of tools that have allowed us to develop ourselves. And the kings of old had great feasts, but here we live today, and they had the time, along with the priests, to consider those high-minded concepts of spirituality and what might happen to us after life. Your regular man, your warrior knew to fight. Your regular man was farming, working, raising a family. He was busy. He didn't have time to sit down and think about these high-minded concepts that with the time that all of us take for granted today. We live in such abundance. We have all of this time to cultivate an understanding of sense and goodly hue. And yet more often than not, we use it to figure out some idea that will feed our righteous indignation. Some idea that will allow us to boost our ego and make us feel better than the next man. To develop some idea that might draw us off the course that was set in motion when we were given soul, sense, heat, and goodly hue, so we might join the divine at that table. Riggs Thula talks about how it's developed. And it's also a little bit talked about as we go further down the list here. And Ash, I know, Yggdrasil is its name, with water white in the great dew tree wet, in the great tree wet. Thence come the dews that fall in the dales, green by earth's well, does it ever grow. Thence come the maidens, mighty in wisdom, three from the dwelling, down neath the tree. Earth is one named Verthandi the next, on the wood they scored, and scold the third. Laws they made there, and life allotted to the sons of men, and set their fates. <laughs> so we're given a boundary. When the Norns come forth, they emerge from the base of Yggdrasil. The universe itself creates a balancing aspect so that we all don't just rush to the table, get a bum rush to the feast or eager's feast. We've got to go through some things. There's some laws we have to abide by. There's some things we've got to deal with and overcome to make the full use of potential of the might that was given to us when, we, when those two were given those gifts from Odin, Vili, and Ve. Those Norns most likely appear at the moment of Odin's death, when he, just before he falls shrieking from the tree, when he sacrifices himself to himself, a balancing act comes forth from the base of the tree. The, uh, there's, an inter there's a really neat uh, article written by the Theosophy Trust uh, talking about Yggdrasil and the Norns that talks about that very thing. The Norns come out when Odin falls shrieking to his death. Um, I write about that in Hell, the Sun-Facing Goddess. But now let's get back to those three females that enter Asgard out of Jotunheim. The three all-powerful female Jotuns that enter Asgard. The war I remember the first in the world when the, hall, when the gods with spears had smitten Goldbeg. And in the hall of horror had burned her, three times burned and three times born, often again, yet ever she lives. That is one of them. Hyth, they named her, who sought their home. One of the three female Jotuns who entered Asgard, she sought their home. The wide-seeing witch in magic wise, mind she bewitched, that were moved by her magic to evil women, she was a joy. Now there's a lot of misinformation about Goldveig as Freya, and she also is known by Heist, and there's all these edgy women that want to be kind of witchy and cool, and Goldveig is the love of gold, the lover of gold. Hyth is the bewitching aspect of men's minds who become moved by this love of gold. The name of the third female Jotun that enters Asgard is Frost Thief. She is the horse thief. She robs people of teamwork. The ability to work as a kindred, to work as a family, to work as a community towards a common goal that all of us might enjoy some kind of success. So when you have all three of those enter this golden age and begin to weave this poisonous thought process throughout the community of the love of gold, the bewitching of men's minds, and the, the theft of the ability of men to work together or work with a horse, you have a real problem in your community. And I've seen many men who have sacrificed the quality time with their families so they might go out and make a lot of money. They might go on the road. They might build a company. They might sacrifice everything because they have this love of gold and how much money they can make. Now, I do not begrudge any man's success. 
there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. And this is a real clear warning. When Odin created something, when his sons raised Midgard out of the sea, they had no problem with this gold. They had no problem with it. There was plenty of wealth and abundance. All of these people worked together to create something fantastic. But when this idea of the love of gold or the gold drink, the bewitching of men's minds towards gold, and the robbery of men to work together, you find this very individualized idea of I'll have success at any cost. And this is a clear warning against it because this is what started the war. This is what split up the golden age of Asgard. This is what destroyed the foundations and set in motion the destruction of all of it or hastened the cycle of it. Because as we talked about in the beginning, when Odin is beginning to talk to the Vlus, but she comes from a previous age, she comes from a previous cycle. Odin is seeking an understanding of what that cycle looks like. It is another part of his quest for wisdom. He's not simply down there having a conversation so he can be more right than the next guy. He's sitting there trying to understand how that cycle works, how people move forward, <coughs> what he can do to make it better. So we have this poisonous aspect that enters Asgard. And then we end up with the war. On the host his spear did Odin hurl, then in the world did war first come. The wall that girdled the gods was broken, and the field by the warlike wains was trodden. That's the first war. So here you have this love of gold, the bewitching of men's mind, and the theft of the ability to work together, the robbery of teamwork among men and horses and animals and what have you. And then this group of individuals show up and say, hey, wait a minute. We ought to get a piece of that too. We might not have done anything to earn it, but we ought to get a piece of it as well. The warlike passions, the individual who is in a warlike state of mind is an individual run by passions. He is... His thought process isn't clear. He's ruled by the passions of the heart. That's why we have crimes of passion in modern law. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones in council held, whether the gods should tribute give or to all alike should worship belong. So now all of a sudden, this kind of socialist communist idea begins to show up in this golden age that had a monarchy. So all of these people that may not have been a part of this golden age, this love of gold has festered out like a poison and begin to bewitch the minds of men who were probably very comfortable doing what they were doing. And now they decided, hey, we get a part of that too. Whether or not we earned it, we're going to trample the walls of your city and we're going to take it for ourselves. Odin, in his passion, throws a spear and starts the war. This is the part where Odin has to go on a journey and figure out, how do I get my kingdom back? All of us have been through that kind of situation where our passions have created some situation in our life. Our own thought process has created a, a situation in our life where our passions got out of control and we brought ruin upon everything that we've created. We may have built something fantastic and our short-sighted passions may have caused us to destroy it just to spite someone else because they wanted half. It's like any man or woman to get divorced. That woman wants half, period, half. She's going to get it. Your business partner, he's going to want a part of it. He may not have done half the work you've done, but he's got a position and a title, and he's put a little bit of money in it. He thinks he's worth a little bit more. Every worker that goes to work every day, well, they ought to be paying me more to put up with this kind of nonsense. That's the kind of thought process. That is the bewitching of men's minds to ask them their egos take control, and they want more than they are worth. They have failed to educate and develop themselves, but they're willing to go to war over it. When you have Antifa marching in the streets saying, hey, we didn't get rid of the kill the rich and all this other nonsense. When you have people that begrudge the rich what they have because they haven't been able to create that success in their own lives. We have this very powerful lesson in these stanzas here where o Uller sits on the throne now, that very wild god of the, of the forests sits on the throne of Asgard at this time. Odin goes and sacrifices himself to himself. Now, what, what the shit does that mean? Well, it's not like he's cutting off an arm. It's not like he's giving himself a lobotomy. He is hanging upon the tree of life, of tree of Yggdrasil, the world tree. He is hanging on that tree to learn. And somewhere along the way, he gets an image of all of his ancestors, and he hears their songs. 
He sees that torch of key now as he sees that wisdom of the past of those who have gone on. And then when he falls, he picks up the runes, that keys to life, the keys to the universe, but it's also a path of life. All of those runes, when interpreted, show you a path of life and what it might look like. From the beginning, when you have wealth, the strength to protect it, the protection from on high, the wisdom of your ancestors, it moves on through all of those tools that you need to move through. When you come to Hagalaz and you find yourself in need, there's been a world-changing idea. Hagalaz is very much in effect here at this point. Odin goes and learns how to become better. He gets rid of that thought process or that emotional baggage or that mentality that is preventing him from ruling with wisdom, that is preventing him from understanding all sides of it so we can be an effective leader. He sacrifices that part of himself that caused his passions to hurl that first spear. And when you look at the peace treaty between the Aesir and the Vanir, what you find are these very cerebral, high-minded sky gods who are distant, and the, and, the, and the three that they bring into the fold is Niord, the god of the sea, full of abundance and fish, and his children, which represents abundance and love and springtime rains. He brings that into Asgard and creates a well-rounded pantheon of gods we might all feel comfortable with that represent every aspect of the human existence, the human condition, this this existence we deal with in this world and finds a balance in it. That's what we're looking for here. But he has to sacrifice that thought process that enabled his passions to create the thing that brought down the walls of everything great that he had built. In swelling rage then rose up Thor. Seldom he sits when such things he hears, and oaths were broken, the words and bonds, the mighty pledges between them made. I know of the horn of Heimdall, hidden under the high-reaching holy tree. On it there pours from Valfather's pledge a mighty stream, would you yet no more? Thor rose up, that great defender, that warder of men. Seldom he sits when such things he hears. Oaths were broken, the words and bonds, the mighty pledges between them made. That's a great wound. That is a great wound in any society. And surely Thor would rise up when he finds that people are breaking their oaths and their words and their bonds and the mighty pledges made between them because that is cross thief. That is the horse thief. That is the third all-powerful female Jotun robbing men of the ability to work together. The warder of men is most assuredly going to stand up to such an grievous offense against what has been created and the expectation that they have for us. And that expectation is laid out with Cavassier and with Rig and, and Rig and the Rig Thula. The Hrostiaf, that female Jotun, that's the one he's want, he's raising up against. The horn of Heimdall hidden. Now Maria Kavalvig puts puts out an idea. I think she's the one that did it. This is the 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 Galar horn is also another word for ear. So we have Heimdall that's sacrificed an ear to see all things, and we have Odin that sacrificed an eye to know all things, to understand that limbic resonance that occurs between people. If you have your finger on an understanding of that limbic resonance between individuals, how they interact with each other, to be able to read what their, what their body language says, what, they, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, you can know a great deal. You will understand how to deal with people. You will understand a lot. In that, in that well, you have an ear and an eye. Two more things that have been sacrificed by gods so they might better assist or guide or overwatch men as they move forward in this world. People, I hear a lot of people that want to say, I stand before my gods. I hear a lot of people say the gods aren't interested in us, but I see right here a lot of evidence that suggests they've got a vested interest in our ability to move forward and join them at the table at that divine feast. <laughs> when we stand before our gods, there is one condition that goes with it. Have we made of ourselves a being worthy of standing before the gods? Because these divine beings have put forth an enormous amount of effort, of sacrifice to become what they're supposed to become. Have we? Or have we simply engaged 
and those ideas that feed our righteous indignation to determine how right we are with regards to the path we're on? Have we found an enemy to rail against? Or have we decided that has nothing to do with me, it's robbing me of my ability to enjoy teamwork? This is what we have to consider as we move forward in this faith, because when it all comes down to it, and you look at all of the other faiths in the world, when you look at Catholicism and you have priests uh, raping nuns and molesting boys to the tune of thousands of them, and still there are a billion people that find purpose, guidance, and direction from that great mistake. When you see Islam, 20% of them are radical, willing to blow up and kill anyone that doesn't believe in their faith, and yet still there's a billion of them, and it's providing per somewhere along the way, there are enough people within those two ideologies that are enjoying success. And so far, the litany of successes that we ought to be promoting because we've adopted this way of life seems to be few and far between. Very few men have had the courage to stand up and say, hey, I have enjoyed success in this endeavor because I follow the principles I find in the poetic and the prosetta. Because they're afraid of some internet bully saying, hey, it's, you can't do that. That's not really right, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter whether or not archaeology agrees with what we have in front of us. This is what we have in front of us. And all, and I do mean all, interpretations of what we're supposed to be living as also true comes from those two books. Everything else is simply an opinion, a hubris, or an idea. The goal of what we're doing here is to focus on these ideas so that when we stand up and say, hey, I'm successful because I read the Poetic and the Prosetta. That book, these two books are providing me with an idea that allow me to move forward in the world. Where is that in our faith today? Because I'll tell you, if there were enough people doing that, we would not be able, we would not be the victims of all of these people pointing out. And I, for one, do not feel like going through the rest of my life playing the underdog or the victim or living in you know, concerned that I might get doxxed and lose my job. The scales are not balanced in our favor right now because we haven't been able to stand up and say, hey, these are the litany of successes that the people that follow us true get to enjoy. Because every time we stand up to do that, we've surrendered the semantic high ground to some other individual who wants to say, well, no, you can't really believe that because I'm, you know, I'm more right than everybody else. We've ended up with a foundation of shifting sand. And we've got to stop that. This is that example of how to stop that. We've got to be aware of those three all-powerful female yotes that enter Asgard. She is not Freya. Alone I sat when the old one sought me, the terror of gods engaged in mine eyes. What hast thou to ask? Why comest thou hither? Oh, then I know where thine eyes is, is hidden. She tells him she knows who he is. I know where Odin's eye is hidden, deep in the wide-famed well of Mimir. Meat of the pledge of Odin each morn does Mimir drink. So there's this huge giant. Well, he's ahead now. But there's other individuals constantly garnering wisdom from that well. But Odin had to give an eye for it. What are we willing to give to drink from the wisdom of that every day? Necklaces had I and rings from here, Father. Wise was my speech and my magic wisdom. Widely I saw over all the worlds. When we talk about the Heimlugoth, when Freya escorts, well, that's not the Heimlugoth. When Freya escorts her boar to the Valfather, she points out that he gives many boons, he gives many blessings. But here it suggests that necklaces I had and rings from the here father, there were many gifts involved. There was abundance in the life of enjoying, of following Odin. While she was alive, she was wise in her speech and her magic had wisdom. Widely I saw over all the world. She began to understand there's a, there's a real deep idea involved in what we might garner from these examples of action that Odin takes. And it does hint at the fact that we might enjoy success. On all sides, I saw Valkyries assemble, ready to ride to the ranks of the gods. Skuld bore the shield, and Skogel rode next. Guth, Hild, Gondol, 
and Gershkogel, of Hirion's maidens, the list have ye heard, Valkyries ready to ride over the earth. Ragnarok is a cycle, and this is the beginning of that. And the Valkyries begin to assemble. I saw for Baldur the bleeding god, the son of Odin, his destiny set. Famous and fair in the lofty fields, full grown in strength, the mistletoe stood. From the branch which seemed so slender and fair came a harmful shaft that Hoth, Hoth should hurl. But the brother of Baldur was born ere long. One night old fought Odin's son. His hands he washed not, his hair he combed not, till he bore to the bell blaze Baldur's foe. But in Fensilir did Frigg weep sore for Valhall's need. <laughs> In my book, Hail the Sun Facing Goddess, I point out that the actions of Loki may well be the actions of the church. When they approach the blind and the infirm and the outcast, the fringe of society, and whisper in their ear about these ideas that come, we'll take care of all your needs and blah, blah, blah. He's whispering a very harmful idea that flies in direct opposition to our ideas of industriousness, self-reliance, and perseverance. And he hurls that shaft that robs the world of its sunlight. Balder represents the shining one, the sun of the world. And when the fringe element of society begins to hurl those harmful shafts at the center of all of our gods and goddesses, they are robbing us of what we might look to as our future, of what, what, what we might have as that example of what to become, of how to act, of how to behave. So when we look at these actions, we see the actions of the church. First, they rob us of our understanding of the afterlife with this misconception about hell. Secondly, they begin to whisper to the fringe element of society, the downtrodden, the people that won't try, the people that are mentally ill, the blind, the infirm, the old, and say, hey, we'll take care of you. You don't need to try anymore. And they stole from uh, our ancestors the ability to stand up for themselves. And now everybody's on their knees. And we're here to reclaim that. So we've got to understand how we lost it. And that right there is exactly how we lost it. And to get it back, we also have that example. The brother of Balder was born ere long. And one night old fought Odin's son. His hands he washed not, his hair he combed not. That is not talking about being a nasty dude. That is talking about a single-mindedness of purpose that is not distracted to the left or to the right by political ideas or righteous indignation or universalist or folkish or this hate or that hate. It is a single-minded focus to get back what we lost. And it's right there in the Voluspa. And it's what we ought to be talking about. It's what we need to be acting like. That single-mindedness of purpose that guides us back to that table where we might feast with the divine. I give a damn about anything else happening outside these rooms that I sit in. I don't care if someone thinks the Jews rule the world or Islam is going to take over. They probably will. They probably do. You want to know why? Because we don't have that single-mindedness of purpose of not washing our hands and not combing our hair. That is, that is, that is the example that takes Baldur's foe out. We lacked that focus, purpose, and direction, and it is time for us to regain it, and it's right there in the Voluspa. One did I see in the wet woods bound, a lover of ill and the Loki like. By his side does Sigyn sit, nor is glad to see her mate. Would you yet no more? Sigyn means girlfriend. So here we have this individual that whispered to Hoder to take Rob the son from the world that stole from us our understanding of what it means to stand up and be men and women. Loki is bound because of that. But he also represents that uninspired human intellect, that ego, that individual that says, well, since you're up, get me a beer. And he is bound. Well, this woman is bound with him, even though there's not a chain on her. And she's going to suffer because of his tirade. Everything that she was ever meant to become is sacrificed because of the ego-driven ideas of this, of this individual who was not interested in measuring up to a standard, 
but would rather point out the flaws and the failures of everyone else or everything else instead of grow into something he was supposed to become. This being had all of the opportunity in the world to sit at that table of the divine and demonstrate he was worth being there. And instead of doing that, he murdered whatever individual might get more praise or attention than he does. So he's bound. And the girl that's with him must sacrifice everything she is. And I see it happen every day with men and women in relationships. A woman must wear a burqa or walk behind him, have long hair, wear a dress. You're not as important as I am. The quality of every good man is whether or not he can create an environment where a woman might feel free to express the beauty of who she is. It might be safe to do so. That's a very tall order for men because we don't understand what that beauty might look like. We don't know what it might draw to us. So we've got something to learn there as well. We also find it in the, in the Voluspa. From the east there pours through poisoned veils with sword and daggers the river Slith. Northward are Hall and Nith Valir of gold there rose for Sindri's race. And in Onkalir, another stood where the giant Bremer his beer hall had. A hall I saw far from the sun. On Nastrond it stand and the doors face north. Venom drops through the smoke vent down while around the walls do serpent wind. I saw there waiting through rivers wild, treacherous men and murderers too and workers of ill with the wives of men. Their Nighod sucked the blood of the sane and the wolf tore men. There's a clear outline there of what we're, what is lined up against us. You have a faction over here, you have a faction over there. You have all of these ideas and concepts. And if we are those treacherous men and murderers, if we are the workers of will with the wives of men, we're enabling and strengthening those forces that line up against our faith. We are drifting from our purpose. Treacherous men are the men that would succumb, would, would far more prefer to empower their righteous indignation because of a political idea than they would in building a faith and enjoying that single-mindedness of purpose that brought Hoder to the bale fire. We've got to understand when we begin to focus on this path, when our litany of successes becomes tantamount to everything else going on in the world, that's when we begin to enjoy some of the freedom that comes with being free men of Nosotry. Not before. Pointing out all of these other things doesn't do anything to further this story, but it does create an idea. It does remind us that that's happening. The giant is old in ironwood set, and in the east and bore the brood of Fenrir. Among these one in monster's guise was soon to steal the sun from the sky, the great wolf that chases the sun. There he feeds full on the flesh of the dead, and the home of the gods he reddens with gore. Dark grows the sun, in summer soon come mighty storms. <laughs> on a hill there set, and smote on his harp, Egthar the joyous, the giant's warder. And above him the cock and the birdwood crowed, fair and red did fall our stand. Then to the gods crowed Golankambi, he wakes the heroes in Odin's hall, and beneath the earth does another crow, the rust red bird at the bars of hell. Now Garm Houghton. So we have these three birds, and there is a concept that's repeated in the lore with um, in the Rig's Thula and with uh, when the Regans and the Regans Mall where the heroes begin to understand the language of the birds. The language of the bird are the flows of energy across the world. A bird can understand where, if he's born in captivity and you cut him loose, he will understand where to go for his migration grounds. He will fly halfway across the world to nest. They understand, they understand the flows of energy, these magnetic fields. Um, certain animals do it as well, foxes do it. Um, we don't understand those signs anymore. We don't understand those flows of energy anymore. We're so comfortable, all we got to do is go to the store and have a feast like a king. The language of the birds is repeated in mythologies all around the world, and it always represents a greater understanding of what's happening in the world. And here we have three birds that begin to give signs that cause men and heroes and villains to stand up. 
perhaps it's time for us as we begin to understand these flows of energy to stand up with that same single-mindedness of purpose. Now Garm howls loud before Nipilir. The fetters will burst and the wolf run free. Much do I know and more can see of the fate of gods, the mighty in fight. Brothers shall fight and fell each other and sister's son shall kinship stain. Hard it is on the earth with mighty whoredom. Axe time, sword time, the shields are sundered. Wind time, wolf time, ere the world falls, nor sh ever shall men each other spare. Take a look at the Middle East and you'll see all of that. Take a look at every third world country that you can think of and you'll see that. Look at Mexico, look at caravans of people fleeing those very ideas to come to someplace that seems safe. <laughs> and yet here we have people marching in the street to tear down old statues. All of these groups of people are emitting energy. They are emitting chaos. What do you suppose is feeding off of that energy? Because there's an awful lot of it being released into our world. Every shout, every yell, every hateful slogan. These are these great signs that chaos is building. Something is feeding off of that energy. Fast move the sons of men and fate is heard in the note of the galler horn. Loud blows Heimdall, the horn is aloft, and fear quake all who on hell roads are. Everybody is on that hell road. Everybody is on that road to death. Every step we take, every minute of every day, we are moving one step closer to that final doorway where we will have to deal with the hell of the sun facing goddess. The sons of men are those great waves that wash across the earth, tidal waves, but it also speaks of a very ancient time. It also speaks of a time before or during the last ice age, perhaps even 12,000 years ago. Yggdrasil shakes and shiver on high, the ancient limbs and the giant is loosed. To the head of Mim does oath and heed, he seeks that wisdom. But the kinsmen of Surt shall slay him soon. How fare the gods, how fare the elves. All Jotunheim groans, the gods are at council. Loud roar the dwarves by the doors of stone, the masters of the rocks, would you yet know more. Now Garm howls loud before Nipilir, the fetters will burst and the wolf run free. Much do I know and more can see of the fate of gods, the mighty in fight. Uncontrollable forces begin to shape up and burst free. Revolutions, wars, disease, death, they begin to run rampant across our planet. It's a cycle. Look at the times of peace and the times of war throughout the history, the little bit of history that we have, and you will see that ebb and flow of energy. Great world wars come and go. Small ones pop up here. Hundred years war here, a civil war here, until we get tired of it. And that's basically what stops all of these wars is we simply get tired of it or we blow up the biggest bomb. <laughs> when men forget that, that's when they begin to enact it again. From the east comes Hiram, a shield held high, and giant wrath does the serpent writhe. Over the waves he twists, and the tawny eagle gnaws corpses screaming. Naglfar is loose. Over the sea from the south there sails a ship with the people of hell. At the helm stands Loki. After the wolf do wild men follow, and with them the brother of Bylist goes. The people of hell are the people of the misty hell, that second past the misty hell is the ninth realm that's not often mentioned eight realms are usually mentioned in the in the Voluspa, but the ninth realm is the misty hell that's where nidhogg gnaws on the souls of corpses that's where the deceivers of men's wives the murderers the treacherous men misty hell is where it's at the people when the people of hell this is much like hades where the name of the place because is 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 uh, similar to the name of the god. But you have to remember that Balder also resides in hell because she, Odin, she's the, a very ancient goddess. She has power over death over all the nine realms, not just one, but all of them. She is not a child of Loki. She's a much more ancient goddess than that. <laughs> As the barrows, the ship barrels of the north faced south, there was always a goddess standing at that barrel of the sun-facing goddess to welcome them in. You have a similar concept of the Elysium Fields. When Christianity railed across Europe, 
the first thing it did was to change our concept of what the afterlife looked like, of the afterlife looked like and supplant it with something else more beneficial to them. And in this, this is where they vilified the goddess hell. But if you look, well, you have to read the book. I'll get, I'll get into that later. After the wolf do wild men go, here we go. Cert fares from the south with the scourge of branches, the fire burns. The son of the battle gods shone from his sword. The crags are sundered, the giant women seek, the dead throng hellway, and heaven is cloven. So the fire part, the gigantic loss of life, the, the clogged highways to, of the dead, and heaven is split, is one hint that goes along with sons of men being on the march that speaks of a very ancient disaster. Now comes look to lean another, yet another hurt, when Odin fares to fight the wolf, and Belly's fair slayer seeks out Surt, and there must fall the joy of Frigg. Belly's fair slayer is Frey. He seeks out Surt. Then comes Sigfather's mighty son, Vithar, to the fight with the foaming wolf. And the giant son does he thrust his sword full to the heart, his father is avenged. Vithar is one of the gods that survives Ragnarok. Hither comes the son of Lothan. The bright snake gaps to heaven above. Against the serpent goes Odin's son. And anger smites the warrior of earth. Forth from their homes must all men flee. Nine paces fare the son of Jorgen, and slain by the serpent, fearless he sinks. So forth from their homes must all men flee. That also ties into this great disaster that I'm talking about. And, and stanza 57 is where it really points it out. The sun turns black, earth sinks in the sea, hot stars down from heaven are whirled, fierce grows the steam and the life-eating flame till fire leaps high about heaven itself. So all of these things when taken into consideration, in my mind, speak of, a, of an ancient disaster. Every mythology has its flood myth, but this one is far more accurate than I think people understand when you look at the Younger Dryas impact and you see this comet that strikes the Laurentide ice sheet, it creates a tidal wave that washes across Western North America that's 1,250 feet high. That's the sons of Mem on the march. We know how high it was because there are boulders sitting on the side of mountain that were carried there in icebergs the size of oil tankers. And then when that happened, it, it created a huge amount of ejecta and turned the sky black, but it rained for days and days and days as all of that ejecta fell back to the earth. It filled up Lake Bonneville, which burst its dam and created the Snake River Canyon. It filled up the Velas Crater in New Mexico and burst its dam and washed across there. All across Western North America, this was occurring. In North Dakota, in Minnesota, the same thing is happening. It's washing across and creating huge river beds that no longer fill up. The Woods Hole Oceanic Institute says that the same kind of flood water was washing into the Arctic Ocean at the same time. So it's flooding across everything. The sea levels rise 400 feet. That's a land area the size of China and Europe combined. 10 million square miles of land is now underwater. And at the same time, a huge fire is burning across North America. Above every Clovis culture site, there's a layer of black mat about that thick. It's about an inch thick. That is the ash of the forest fire that burnt across North America. Everything was destroyed. And fragments of that comet landed in Greenland, landed in Europe, landed in the Middle East. All of these people must flee. <laughs> when you see a continent-wide wildfire, it's not hard to imagine a man with a great family fighting that fire with an elk handle implement to protect everything that he loves. It's not hard to see some great being trying to protect his village from that flood that gapes up to heaven. These great legends, these great tales, these great heroes and gods that are the defenders and warders of men that are trying to guide us into something better. When we see their efforts here at the end of all things, we understand that how much of that was lost. How difficult would it be to pass that knowledge for us to understand how the cycle of Ragnarok happens because very few of us are gonna go talk with the Veluspa, but we might have the runes. 
We might have some symbols that allow us some guidance through this world to become something better than we are. But we have to remain focused. <clears throat> now do I see the earth anew, rise all green from the waves again, the cataracts fall and the eagle flies and fish he catches beneath the cliffs. The gods and if of all meet together, of the terrible girdler of earth they talk, and the mighty past they call to mind. In the ancient runes of the ruler of gods, are we not doing that very thing right now? Are we not talking, calling to mind those tales of ancient gods? Are we not discussing the mighty past and the girdle of the earth? Are we not discussing every day these ancient runes? And yet we look at them with blind eyes. But we live in that time now. In wondrous beauty, once again, shall the golden table stand amid the grass, which the gods has owned in the days of old. Then fields unsowed bear ripened fruit. All ills grow better and Balder comes back. Balder and Hoth dwell in Prope's battle hall and the mighty gods. We live in a wondrous, beautiful time. How many of us understand how special it is to walk in the forest and feel what it's like to understand the peace of nature? What bounty might we all enjoy if we but go to the store and buy whatever feast we feel like eating? We have the opportunity now to sit at golden tables and stand amid the grass, which the gods owned in the days of old. And yet we're still facing those same threats that they faced then. That cycle continues again and again and again. Then Honir wins the prophetic wand and the sons of the brother, brothers of Tavigi abide in, in wind, Windheim now. <laughs> I don't know what the prophetic wand is, but when Balder and Hoth, is the guy that shot him, dwell in Hrope's battle hall, that's Valhalla. Hrope's battle hall is Valhalla. Balder and Odur live there together. They figured something out on their journey. When, when, they were, when they lost their life, they had to travel a different path. They were removed from that path that is the cycle of the gods and made their path through a different realm, governed by a different goddess. And there were many things for them to learn there too. When they returned, they've got a different set of ideas. We have a different set of ideas now too. We don't have the same struggles that they have every day. We have our new set of struggles, don't we? And yet, that ancient wisdom still guides us to move through all of that. More fair than the sun, a hall I see, roofed with gold on Gimli it stands. There shall the righteous rulers dwell. These are the, these are the gods and goddesses that survived Ragnarok. And happiness ever shall, there shall they have. There comes on high all power to hold a mighty lord, all lands he rules. This is Balder. And from below, the dragon dark comes forth. Nithog flying from Nithyfjall, the bodies of men on his wings, he bears the serpent bright. So Nithog is still there. He's still chewing on the, on the deceivers of men's wives, the murderers, the treacherous men. Balder is the ruler there in the future. That return of Balder, that, the, the death and resurrection of a divine being has been told 16 times in mythologies that I know of, and I'm sure it's been done many more times. This tale with this kind of writing of what might have happened in the Younger Dryas tells me that it is much older than what people would suggest as Christianity, because most of the time when people say it's too heavily Christianized, they're coming from the position that Christianity came first, when such is not the case. This very ancient tale has been told around fires and given people hope and strength and ideas and courage to move forward with the understanding that there might literally be something on our side that's given us gifts where we can enjoy the success and become kings by our own hand. We live in an age today when nothing could be easier. They print money every day. The amount we want to make is all up to us. It has all of the ideas of success, all of the ideas that something divine might be working on our behalf. It's all the ideas that they may have left a message, a, a set of instructions in the runes. That tells me there is something very powerful and very deep here that goes beyond much of the understanding I see being proposed as understanding of Austria today. So when I say I find it comical 
for someone to say, to judge the quality of my heathenry because I don't subscribe to their mental illness. Now you know why. And I hope you enjoyed all of that today. I, I thank you for taking the time on Sunday to join me. And I, I hope you, uh, Game of Thrones is on tonight, so I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, y'all have a good day. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Ryan. It was a pleasure. Guys. Have a good you. day, you guys. You too. Hey, Melissa. Yeah. Are we staying on for uh, uh, Daughters of Freya or? Are we doing six o'clock for that or five? I don't know. What time is it? It's five. It's just not five. Okay. Then, yeah, I think it's six. Okay. All right. So we'll be back on at six, right? Yeah, the same number? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Enjoy that workout. Yep. Bye. <laughs> so is that just for you ladies? Yeah, that's just for us. We have a group called the Daughters of Freya, and it's it's just for women. Okay. Babe, you should probably join in that. Learn <laughs> some more. <laughs> yeah. uh, so good night. <clears throat> while I've got you here, what did you think about the uh, the business name? What was your opinions, your thoughts? You were going for Slipner, right? Yeah, I was thinking about it. I wanted everybody else's opinions on what sounded decent. Melissa, I can't hear you. You're muted. Melissa, why are you muted again? 